Hi guys, my name is Jen Paffinroth. I am the business support manager here at IEC Thermo. Um, this is our eighth webinar Wednesday, and today I am joined by Jeff Griswold, the lead project manager at IEC Thermo, and Shauna Cook, the business development manager at IEC. And we're really glad you're able to join us, um, whether you're here on Zoom or watching our live stream on Facebook. Um, you guys have been asking such good questions, and today we just wanna take some time to answer your questions, and um, mainly we'll be focusing on questions that have to do with the drying part of the supply chain and also any questions about IEC thermos, high efficiency, multi-phase hemp dryers. Um, so at any time today during this webinar, you can drop your question in the little Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom window and Shauna and Jeff will answer them for us. So I will turn it over to you guys. Perfect, thanks so much, Jen. Um, yep, my name's Shauna Koch. I'm the Business develop Development Manager at IEC Thermo. Um, I do take on the sales and marketing role as part of our team. Um, you know, I have a little bit of background in the adult use market here in Washington State and then the hemp market as well. Um, I've got a little bit of experience from the administrative and safety side all the way back to actual growing and the garden management. Um, I also did a lot of drying and curing and traceability as well. So even if you just have any general industry questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, who's a new face. I am Jeff Griswold, and I'm the uh, lead project manager for IEC, and I use the process as well as, well as a, I am a member of the project management team. So uh, my, my role has been in project management for the last 10 years. Uh, I came from the telecommunications industry, uh, which is a very um, uh, process-driven industry. So coming into the uh, agricultural industry with the hemp has been a, is very exciting and been very challenging to help uh, IEC get the processes um, you know, formulated. Uh, so when we uh, get a good sale, we deliver the product as expected and set the expectations to the uh, customer and uh, work with their timelines. So I work from that area. Um, so any questions you have about uh, post-sale or any of our processes with uh, assembly or any of that, I can answer as well. Perfect, yeah, let's just dive in. So what is IEC Thermo? We are a manufacturer of American-made hemp dryers. We also do a lot of dabbling in um, other drying industries as well. We do some custom jobs, we do some wood jobs, um, kind of anything that falls under that industrial drying umbrella. Um, IEC does it, or we can at least point you in the direction of someone who does. Um, uh, Jeff, can we talk a little bit about what comes with the purchase of an IEC dryer, and are these systems typically turnkey? We really don't want, we're, we don't uh, necessarily use the term turnkey because it uh, leads into people thinking that uh, we're doing the, the gas piping, the plumbing, and the electrical as well. And that's part of the responsibility of the customer. So we, we furnish all the IEC dryer equipment along with the components, uh, the PLC components, uh, all the drawings needed for the local electrician and the local gas company as well as the fuel plumber that will be plumbing up the uh, burners to the valve trains. So upon sale, we have a very detailed letter that we send out to the customer that lays out all the responsibilities between IEC and uh, the customer to set all expectations for the process. Yeah, absolutely. What's great about IEC is that we try to be, for the most part, all in. So our, our standard pricing includes hardware, delivery, assembly, commissioning, and training. And Jeff touched on a little bit of what that um, assembly and commissioning process looks like. Our systems are definitely not turnkey. However, we do try to be as all-inclusive as we can. However, like Jeff said, our customers definitely do have a responsibility to prep their site. Um, and if you want a little bit more detailed information on that, you can look at our FAQs on our website and we kind of break that down a little bit more there and then in greater detail, like Jeff said, in our proposals and in our initial letters to customers. 
Here's a general system overview of what an IEC system looks like. Um, here we have the metered feed hopper. That's the very beginning of our system. You would load material into that. From there, it conveys into a secondary mill. From there, it actually conveys into the start of our system. So um, we've talked in you know, previous um, episodes about the multi-phase, meaning two phases, two heating elements in our dryer. The very first one is this uh, flash dryer here, and that's where our product mixes with warm air for the first time, and then is immediately allowed to cool as it travels through this ductwork, and through the very first cyclone where it cools down as well. There it typically conveys into the fluid bed, which is the second heating element, and that one's kind of like the air hockey table where it bounces the material around with warm air from underneath, kind of suspending those particles and getting that excess or at least the remaining moisture out, usually to that 10% mark. <clears throat> From there, the lighter material actually goes up and over into the second cyclone. So that will be sort of your shredded buds and leaves, anything that's a little bit less dense. Um, anything that is dense or is heavier would actually be able to come out this bottom part here. So the light stuff goes up and out, the heavy stuff goes down and out and actually reintegrates at the be right below the second cyclone. And from there, it goes into our pneumatic cooler um, and conveyor system as well. And that's actually where product exits our system. So you see the very beginning of the system with the metered feed hopper, and you see the very end of our system with this pneumatic cooler. And product, like we said, typically travels through this entire system in under two minutes, all while remaining or retaining the integrity of those cannabinoid molecules and actually some terpene profiles as well. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Jeff, did you want to touch on anything on the actual system itself? And all this is, I just wanted to mention that it is all tied together back to the MCC, which is controlled by a PLC. Um, and it's very um, customizable to how you operate your uh, dryer based on your environment. Because we all know that hemp is different throughout the country. And obviously, weather and weather patterns change drastically in the 50 states. Absolutely, great point. So everybody that has an IEC dryer utilizes it or loads it or uses it in their process a little bit different. You know, some people do a couple extra steps um, in preparing that feed for the dryer. Some people have a couple of steps after the dryer. Um, but in general, like, like Jeff said, our system is very customizable to your specific needs and your specific site as well. Um, people always ask me, you know, what, what does your footprint look like? And that definitely varies. We'll get into that a little bit too. Every dryer that we build is built site specific. So no two dryers that we've installed look exactly the same just because no two buildings that we've put a dryer in look exactly the same. So we really do try to tailor it to your specific needs. And we wanted to touch a little bit on capacities of our system because that's a great question. You know, the number one question I get is how big is it? How much hemp can it dry? And that's a tricky question to answer because the, the answer relies on a lot of factors. And I think the most important factor would be moisture content. So this graph on the um, left hand side here shows the product output relative to moisture content. So if you've got something that's say 80% moisture, you'll see a, a definitely decreased capacity if you were looking at something at say 60% moisture. Um, and the way to think about our dryers too is that it's really hard to narrow down an exact capacity. We like to talk about capacities and ranges just because like Jeff said, hemp varies incredibly, you know, between how it's been chopped, how it's been grown, the different genetics, um, you know, how it's been harvested or any of that, that those processes that prepare the feed. Um, so all of those do actually affect capacities of dryers. So you can see on the right hand side there, we budget, you know, about 1,000 to 3,000 pounds per hour for our 3,000 system, two to six for our six, six to 15 for our 15. Um, so there's definitely a couple of tips and tricks you can do to maximize capacity, but it's really important to note that capacity is a range that depends on a lot of different factors. So you will not see a consistent capacity when you're dealing with hemp, just because like we said, you know, no, to hemp shipments or hemp um, units like totes um, 
are the same. Anything to add, Jeff? And all of the harvesting methods are different throughout the country too, as well. So that's, and that's why we've added in 2020, we've added the mill on the front with the metered feed hopper, because we feel that uh, that helps us get the sizing we need to get the customer to the closest capacity with the hemp that they're drying. And consistency too, adding that mill has definitely improved the consistency of our systems as well as like Jeff said, capacity and then performance as well. So we just, we realized that, you know, in most cases adding, or all cases, adding this mill improved capacity, improved performance. So we just went ahead and we added it to all of our 2020 models, um, just knowing that it saves you the headache. So we just went ahead and threw it in there because we knew that it would, it would make a difference. Here's a list of our specs and requirements um, for our systems. So you see the 3,000, the 6,000, and the 15,000 unit. Um, our systems all do run off of natural gas or liquid propane and then electricity as well. You also do need an internet connection for the MCCs as well. Um, and I'm definitely going to turn this over to Jeff because this is definitely his area of expertise. All right, so the 3,000, 6,000, 15,000. Um, so we have the electrical uh, horsepower listing here. Like I said, along with the sale, you get a pretty complicit letter from us that gives you uh, very detailed information for the electrician, the natural gas company, and the plumbing uh, operation that will be plumbing up your units. So the 3,000 and 8,000 um, BTU, uh, 8 million BTUs, and then we have 16 billion BTUs and 40 uh, million BTUs and the 15,000. Uh, our footprints for the 3,000, we prefer a 50 by 90. Um, and we've talked before that that's modifiable, but that is basically our, our, our suggested footprint. It can be modified. And one of the reasons we ask for that type of footprint is we're look, always looking at production. This is a production floor. It's not just the dryer. You're gonna have forklifts, you're gonna have super sacks, you're gonna have personnel moving on that floor and you have to um, consider your safety issues and your productivity that will flow on that floor as, as you dry your hemp in and out. And, and like I said, safety is always a big factor there. So these footprints are based on what we feel is appropriate for a safe and uh, opera uh, operation of a production, of hemp production on that layout. So. That's why we asked for 50 by 90 for the 3,000, 60 by 100 for the 6,000, and 80 by 120 for the 15,000. And then of course we have to consider ceiling heights here because the cyclones are the, high, the tallest uh, components in our system. And cyclone heights, uh, we, we suggest 25 feet and that gives us clearance. So when we're putting an, in an assembly, uh, we have clearance to to actually do that above the cyclone and lift anything above the cyclone or get above the cyclone for any maintenance reasons later. Um, there will be maybe some times where throughout the years you may uh, pull a duct apart to do an inspection. And so you need to be able to get up in those areas and have that clearance. Um, so total weight, we have a total weight of uh, the system and we can give you breakdowns for it as needed. Uh, we give that to you and we ship it to you, uh, and as well as when we ship it to you, uh, which is a responsibility for offloading from the customer, we give you pictures of the trucks and what's on those trucks, what you'll need to uh, telehandler capacities to actually unload that truck as well. So Jeff, I have a question. Not everybody has the luxury of, you know, a 45 foot tall ceiling. Um, can these cyclones go outside? Do we see any difference or any effect in putting them outside? So the cyclones can be located outside. And when we do that, we have to consider the outside environment. Um, so what we found last year and we've improved on the 2020 unit is we're actually insulating the pre-dryer duct uh, run, which is um, over 100 feet or up to 150 feet. We prefer 150 foot, foot of that pre-dryer duct. Um, that, um, those cyclones being outside, what you'll notice, and we saw people that were drying throughout the winter this year, is there's a special startup that you have to do when you're drying in a cold environment. Basically, you have to 
start your machine up and you let, have to get, get it to a nominal temperature. So all the vessels, all the condensation is worked out for the best results. So yes, um, cyclones can go outside, but you got to consider your, your wind load, your temperatures outside. And uh, if you're in a cold environment, it can be, it can be a bit challenging in the winter time. Have you seen it help to maybe build an awning or try to enclose those outdoor cyclones in any way? Has that made a difference? No one has done that thus far. Um, so um, that would, because of the, the height, especially the 15,000, it may be kind of, that'd be, we, uh, we have one 15,000 currently with the cyclones outside and it's in, in a high desert area in Nevada. And then we have another one in Canada that has inside cyclones. And the, the height of the ceilings is right at the 45 foot mark for us. So those people with the inside cyclone in Canada obviously have a cold environment. It's highly advised to keep those inside. Perfect. So depending maybe on regionally where you are and That's, what your winter conditions look like. Yeah, your winter conditions, if you're going to drive, drive year round, will predict where you really want to put those cyclones. You will have to, if you have a cold environment, you will reduce capacity. So you have to take that in consideration. And Jeff, can you walk us through a little bit, um, kind of how the process works with the project managers? What does that initial letter look like? What does that initial site visit look like? Are we able to help our customers all the way through the process? Where do we kind of draw that line in the sand? Well, we're pretty, we're pretty open with our customers and uh, we're not the end all uh, for all the answers, but we will lead you to those answers that we can do. Uh, we can give you uh, details on. So what you get is you get a letter that has responsibilities and a planning scope with the IEC and the customer. Uh, it talks about permitting and the, our machine is considered an agricultural dryer. So all the permitting should be listed under agricultural system. Uh, we, we go through that type of detail. We talk to you about the, f the fuel supplier and utility, uh, the, five to t uh, the five to 10 pounds of PSI that we required at each valve train, um, either natural gas or propane. So we lead you through that. And then fuel system requirements, of course, I just talked about the, uh, there's three different uh, sizes for dryers. So, um, and the five to 10 pound max PSI at the valve train is a, is a standard requirement for all three units. We also give you guidance for the electrician, giving you the uh, required voltage, three phase for all the motors, the total horsepower. Um, and we work directly with the electrician, providing them drawings and doing, we do, do get quite a few uh, questions you know, that come our way during the uh, installation because some of this stuff is very unique to uh, to agriculture. If an electrician isn't used to it, we do get a lot of questions. We either answer those or we can use our other vendors to uh, provide those answers. So then uh, basically we, that sets you up for getting us ready for delivering assembly because we've got the building ready, we've got the electricity, we've got the gas and the permitting is all done. The next thing we would do is plan out the, um, based on the contract, the delivery, and then we would plan our assembly phase. Uh, the assembly phase takes between the three and the six, takes about two weeks and the 15, you can add another week, depending on if it's inside and how tight maybe the uh, the environment would be the 15,000 because it has those tall cyclones can take extra time. So I, that's why I sh we asked for an extra week, maybe 15 to 20 days on that one. Uh, then after we get done doing the assembly, your electrician has about two weeks worth of work uh, to do. The gas company obviously has to bring your gas, your, your fuel line into the building and then either they or another plumber will plummet to the valve trains. Uh, the gas, uh, the valve trains are to be installed by the customer plumber and we do everything else. We install all the components. We adapt the, the uh, burners to the furnaces and uh, it's pretty much ready to be wired up when we leave after assembly. Then after assembly is complete and we stay in touch with the customer, we will ask the electrician to do some motor rotations and bumps prior to our deployment to come out and do commissioning. That allows us to 
and we can do that remotely as well. Uh, if they have an internet connection, we can actually monitor that and watch the rotations and assist with either via the VFDs changing the rotation or have the electrician, you know, sometimes they have to reverse the wiring. So that's a preliminary step that we do because it saves us time going into our commissioning. Uh, once we arrive for commissioning, we have about two to three days of uh, pretty much we have to do a full inspection. We uh, pull all the needed serial numbers if they haven't already been gathered so we can do inventory. Uh, we will do a, basically a nut and bolt check, a, a little bit of a shakedown on the system, and then we will do a startup and start commissioning the VFDs and uh, all the components as far as the uh, pressures for the uh, fluid bed and all the, you know, make sure the, not, the uh, motor rotations, the RPMs are matching. So we uh, will get you at a nominal level. And then after commissioning, there will be a pause. Uh, we're going to offer training this year uh, off-site that you will come to a, an, another location to do some preliminary training. And then once you're ready to pick your hemp, we will arrange to come back out and train live on your system. And that's pretty much a high level of how that goes down. Uh, I did, didn't mention that obviously before when your building's ready or prior to your building being ready, we come out and do a site survey. We kind of go through this letter with you explicitly. And like I said, sometimes the electrician's there, sometimes there's other people involved there to, so we can answer questions or take questions home to get answers for you, so. Awesome. Great, well, um, let's get into this. We have some questions coming in now. Um, so thinking a little bit about specs, um, are these, we have a question from Mark, are these units easily convertible from natural gas to propane or vice versa? So yes, the question, that question is, uh, the answer to the question is yes. So um, the, the uh, burners we use, there would, would be a, if you ordered a natural gas system, you would have to do an upgrade to change to propane if you chose to later or vice versa. It takes a modification of the valve train and there's an orifice that, the, the orifices would need to be changed out. So um, we've done, we've actually priced that out and I think that's somewhere in the $2,000 range. It's not terribly expensive, but yes, you would have to do a modification on the valve train. Awesome. All right. Um, we have a message, this is not a question, but we have a message from Laverne that says, huge kudos to Drew and IEC managers for being available and responsive to our on-site general construction team. Thanks, Laverne, that's definitely something we strive for here. Um, and we have another question from Jay, and Jeff and Sean, you guys might wanna look at it too. It's a, it's a little long question, a little bit of a long question. So it says, do you have an equipment process map schematic from harvesting to plant separation to biomass, to milling, to dryer, to secondary milling, to separation, based on the most common setups for various types of processing from CBD plants to grain, fiber, seed? That's a tricky question. I think um, the root of that is that everybody does their process a little bit differently. You know, we're all kind of trying to figure out what that process looks like and what pieces of equipment we can put back to back in making that process. Um, so the short answer is no, we do not have a, a schematic map, but we'd happy to kind of, we'd be happy to walk you through offline um, some of the, the equipment that we've worked alongside and what we call our channel partners. So these are actually companies or businesses in the hemp space that we have worked with and we have worked alongside um, that we have kind of vetted in a sense. Um, so that's something we could definitely discuss offline and that process definitely looks different whether you're going for smokable flour or if you're going for CBD biomass or if you're going for say grain or fiber like you said. So I think definitely the root of that question is number one, what is your end goal? What is your end product that you're working towards? And number two, what pieces of equipment or what processes would you like to see incorporated in something like that? Um, so Jay, feel free to shoot us a message offline um, and we can definitely connect and let you know kind of what we've seen in the space that we feel good about, maybe we don't feel so great about, or just some things to, to take into consideration when you're looking at that entire supply chain, when looking at your business model. 
Awesome. Thanks, Shauna. Um, and then we do have another question. And um, again, you can stay if we want to talk about this offline, but price. Um, what's the price range from low to high for a 3000 system? That definitely, yeah, we should chat offline because we do have a couple of what we call a la carte services or other things that you can kind of tack on, really making your dryer that customized experience, like Jeff said. So, yeah, let's chat offline exactly on what your needs are, what, what are some things that you want to see in a dryer, um, you know, the separation side. Um, we can kind of, yeah, we'll cover that offline just because there's a couple different choices. Where you are also makes a difference depending on, um, you know, delivery fees, things like that. So, yeah, we can chat offline and give you a more, a more specific uh, breakdown or quote if that's what you're looking for. Awesome. Good. Keep the questions coming, guys. Um, I have a question. Um, once, Jeff, you were talking a little bit about um commissioning and all that training when can i expect to be at typical dryer capacities as far as once it's done commissioned exactly so after training um you're going to be left with uh, a manual that, and you're going to be left with some you know some background some troubleshooting so you know there's a there's a some people get it really quickly and some tapes it takes a little a few a little bit longer um, I think there's at least a 30 day cycle of uh, absorption of how the system works based on your environment you have to work with. A lot of uh, some of our previous uh, webinars, um, some of our customers talked about that where they would go out and they would measure the temperature of the outside, the humidity, um, where they were bailing, where they were doing toll uh, drying for bales that, you know, versus fresh hemp. That was also something they had to take in consideration. But we give you the basis. Of, of how to dry and we take you from through the 70% to 10% um, drying sequence. Like I said, it can take 30, it can take up to 40 days to really get your arms around it and really get the capacity. Some people do it much quicker. So it's a lot about how you uh, prep your, your biomass and it's a little bit about how you take it away from the back end too and how efficient that all becomes. And I think what's really exciting too is that sort of two-pronged approach to operator training. You know, we're able to bring your operators to our site to show you how we run our dryers and some of the tips and tricks that some of our customers or our own operators have picked up as we've gone. And then to go and take that knowledge to your site to implement it to your specific design um, I think does does give you a couple more tools to be successful and keep in mind you will not hit capacity within the first week realistically um, like Jeff said there's a bit of a learning curve um, you need to figure out what it takes to calibrate your system and what the manipulation of your temperature set points does to your system so it's a little bit of trial and error and just kind of wrapping your brain around the operation of the system it's a complex piece of I mean, industrial slash agricultural equipment. So don't beat yourself up if by the end of the first day, you know, you're not hitting capacity. That's pretty standard. Um, and even after a month, if you're like, hey guys, like we just cannot wrap our brains around this. We're willing to, to discuss other options in terms of further training as well, really to make sure that, that our customers are successful. And another thing that you got to consider when you're, you're looking at your whole plan for the, the dryer itself, I mean, you could, you could be a processor or you could just be a dryer um, company. So um, you got to think about if you're running multiple shifts, you're going to have, when you start doing your math and start to figure out, you're going to have maintenance to figure in there. So you're going to have downtime between shifts for safety reasons, obviously. And so you have to consider your capacities built on that 24-hour log that you're building and do your business plan smartly so you include those shift changes and those maintenance uh, items that you're going to be looking at and we can give you that information uh, you know upon purchase of the dryer of how we maintain the system and when it needs greased and things like that we have all that data but you have to consider all of that as well um, a lot of people just do the math and they look at the numbers and and when they start doing their production they're they're behind on their you know once they do get to the capacity they seem like they're behind but they're not considering those shift changes they're not considering that maintenance they're not considering some production floor uh things that you need to consider so please add that into your business plan 
Absolutely. Right. So I like to joke about the planning fallacy, which is every project goes 40% over budget and 40% longer. So we like to say just, you know, over budget as opposed to under budget. Definitely, definitely. And here's a good follow up question. Um, so it's, they're saying anonymous is saying it seems like we will need at least four to six weeks to having my staff fully trained before we go live drying material we harvested. Is this accurate? What I would say is uh, during training, you'll have two training sessions. You'll one be off, one uh, off site at a, a training location. And then when we get your hemp and we start working with your hemp and your operators. So at that point, we work with you for several days to show you how to run the dryer. It would take you probably up to 30 days from that point to get to capacity. So you're not training for 30 days, but you're definitely learning for 30 days because you're gonna be hands-on with this machine. And it's very easy to work with. You just have to ha know how to monitor the system, keep an eye on the fluid bed. You're feeding in one end, you're feeding out the other end. You don't wanna overwhelm one to the other. And there's a cause and effect if the system shuts down and we go through that with you, uh, the system shut down. Um, so it's, it's not that hard to grasp. Um, it's just there's key components that you have to monitor and that is actually what makes the whole thing successful when you can actually put those monitoring skills together and understand what the machine is doing and telling you. Great, and um, Laverne, who is the owner of an IEC dryer, um, he was in one of our webinars, you can check it out on YouTube. Um, he adds, it helps to monitor input and output biomass condition against specific temperature and airflow parameters. There's incredible flexibility with PLC parameters. Thanks, Laverne, for adding that. Sure. Um, all right, we have some questions, uh, a question about moisture. So are there areas of the country where the moisture content of the hemp is higher than others or say somewhat more predictable? Good question. That is a great question. That's a great question. So I myself live in Washington State. You know, the Pacific Northwest definitely lives up to its reputation in that it is overcast all the time, you know, after summer, the sun goes away um, and the rain comes. So somewhere like Oregon may have higher or excess moisture just based on the, the weather and the rain. Somewhere like Florida, for example, doesn't really get a lot of rain, but it's incredibly humid there. So places like that, you realistically probably would be looking at maybe 75% moisture content or even 80% moisture content. And that's important, that's an important distinction because we base our capacities off of that 70% moisture content. So if you're putting 80% moisture content in, you will not hit that 3000 capacity mark. Our systems will definitely dry it, it can certainly be done. It would just be at a slow down or a slightly decreased capacity. So definitely can be done, um, but again, just a little bit slower. We've also added a couple tips and tricks this year from what we've seen that that mill helps to make um, the feed consistent, discreet, free flowing. Um, that pre, uh, pre dryer ductwork insulation that Jeff talked on, um, that also helps when dealing with higher humidity. Um, and then the pneumatic cooler on the on the back end helps to cool that product down as well. Um, what have you seen in the field, Jeff? What are some tricks to dealing with with excess moisture or just product or plants that are, you know, over seventy percent? So I saw um, quite a vast difference. I did some uh, site visits in Illinois uh, as well as most of my sites were in Colorado, but I did see baled uh, material come in from the East Coast to Colorado, which was very wet. Uh, Colorado is a very arid, um, especially in the mountains, they get very arid. So they don't have much, anything above 70% going into the dryer. Like you said, the Midwest, the South, Southeast, uh, the North, Northwest, we, there's more humidity, there's more rain. But uh, so those are the environments that you're dealing with that moisture that's increased. And it depends on when you pick your hemp too, it seems to be. Even in the morning, it could be dewy or in the afternoon when it's drier. So those are all things to consider when you're at harvest time. And you one field to the next can be different. You know, the consistency of the hemp can be different. So you'll, you'll get to know your hemp pretty well once you start running it through the dryer. 
Can you touch on conditioning feed? So if you're dealing with something that is, you know, 90% humidity or moisture, and it's just what we call seaweed, um, can you talk a little bit about what conditioning feed looks like? So um, conditioning feed, well, you don't want to put something that, I wouldn't put anything as high as 90% in, into the dryer. You would want to get some air to it, to spread it out, to get it to, you know, do some air drying before you get it in the system. Um, some people in, it, in, in agriculture, this is very common, where you'll, you'll run some hemp that's very, you won't be at capacity, you'll run it, it'll be a bit of a struggle. Uh, it'll be over 10% at the back end and you may rerun that with uh, with your hemp, you know, with a larger, with a bit of a concentration of fresh to, to dry and rerun that hemp. So that's been known to happen in the corn, bean, and the agricultural industry in the past. So that's one step you can take if you get to that. And then it has happened where people have to run it twice. Um, it just comes in so wet. Um, there's not much you can do there. Other than maybe breaking, if you have bales, break those bales open or let it let it uh, dry a little bit, but um, bales can be very troublesome as well. Um, yeah. Great, thanks guys. Um, and shaker tables, you know, shaker tables help to get stems out on the front end. Um, anything you can do on the front to get your sizing correct and not put hemp sticks in, six inch sticks in the dryer, you're gonna have a lot more success on the back end. And anytime you put that stuff in, it takes away from the CBD content on the back end. So you're saving yourself greatly if you can clean it on the front end. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Jeff and Shauna. All right, well, at the moment, we don't have any more questions queued up. Um, let me check on Facebook Live. I don't see if you guys have any questions over on Facebook Live too. You can um comment them and we'll we'll get them answered shauna and jeff anything else that you think is important um to answer or to talk about timing at this point i know everybody's dealing with covid um and all just kind of the craziness of our country right now but if you are growing hemp this year in 2020 um you do need to have your dryer for the most part picked um, or at least start building connections with toll dryers near you. Um, if you realistically cannot get a dryer in time for harvest, um, reach out to some of the dryers in your area, start signing contracts, make sure that you have an out for your product or you have a way, excuse me, to at least stabilize that product, um, you know, come harvest season, it does end up being a bit of a mad dash. So just try to kind of use your, use your future vision um, and try to, you know, uh, just kind of plan plan for drying. Make sure that you have a plan for stabilizing that crop because harvest comes fast and it's pretty unforgiving. Um, so just make sure that, that you are taking steps towards that now. I know we're all worried about planting. That's, you know, its own set of headaches. Um, but there's no sense putting something into the ground if you don't know how you're going to get it out. Um, so that would be that would be my recommendation for, for where we are in the you know, beginning of June. Yeah, definitely great advice, Shauna. Um, awesome. Well, we haven't had any more questions pop up here. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us today. Um, we enjoyed answering your questions. Um, Sean and Jeff, thanks for all the helpful and informative answers you gave us. Um, and if you want to keep the conversation going, reach out to Shauna at info at iecompanies.com. You can see the email address there. Um, and then just a little plug for next week's webinar. We have, um, New West Genetics joining us. Um, they're doing really exciting things in the industry. They've been breeding and developing hemp seed genetics for the last seven years, focusing on a direct feeding solution for row crop farmers. So next week they will discuss key considerations that growers should consider when choosing genetics. They will share the traits they are focused on now and will discuss in detail the agronomic considerations to ensure success along with specifics on how to calculate your return on investment per acre when you plant hemp. So they've been along in, they've been in the industry for a long time. Um, I know it's going to be a great webinar. You can register on our Facebook page or I will put the link in our Instagram bio right when we're done here. Um, 
So yeah, thank you guys so much. And we will see you guys next week. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you.